Turning in our instruction again to the second book of Kings and chapter 11. I'm going to read again the first four verses. Two Kings chapter 11, and we read the first four verses. And when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed royal. But Jehosheba, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons which were slain. And they hid him, even him and his nurse, in the bedchamber from Athaliah, so that he was not slain. And he was with her kid in the house of the Lord six years. And Athaliah did reign over the land. And the seventh year Jehoiada sent and fetched the rulers over hundreds and the captains and the guard and brought them to him into the house of the Lord and made a covenant with them and took an oath of them in the house of the Lord and showed them the king's son. God never makes mistakes was the theme that we closed with as we looked at this woman, Athaliah. <clears throat> what a scene uh, is before us. It seems doesn't it, as though this is one of those occasions in which it looks as though the plans of God have unraveled. Go back to the days of Noah, and you find that there are but Eight human souls left on the face of the planet. Or you turn to King Hezekiah a few years later and you discover that the Assyrian army is at its gates. Hezekiah, it seems, is also sick and he is childless and it seems as though everything of God's plan has come to nothing. Even as you turn to the cross itself and you come to Calvary and it appears to even those in those days that this was the end of everything. It was the end of their hopes. We were looking at those on the, on the Emmaus Road and we listened to them as they bewailed this, that they had trusted that it had been he that who would save and redeem Israel. It seemed to them that everything was finished. You could go to the book of Revelation and chapter 11, and you could see there there's the case of two witnesses. And those two witnesses are the witness to God in this world. And they are left for dead. And the world rejoices over the death of these God-fearing men. And it seems as though everything is finished. But God never makes mistakes. And God demonstrates his sovereignty. And he steers all things to his own will and to the end that he purposes. To Noah, the plans of an ark were given by which they were to ride above the, the waters that covered the face of the earth. To Hezekiah, an angel uh, was sent who destroyed uh, the Assyrian army. In Christ, it is the Son of God who hangs upon the tree. It is the Lord of life and glory. It is the one who is able to lay down his life and take it up again. That hangs there on the tree at Calvary and conquers death. And here in this chapter these verses that we've read in 2 Kings 11, God has in place an otherwise unknown woman who is going to rescue the last of the, the line of David from this wicked woman, Athaliah. And it's this woman, Jehosheba, who is the, the subject of our thoughts this morning. 
What a striking contrast we have between these two women. In Athaliah, uh, we have seen someone who is cruel. We have so seen someone who is utterly godless. By contrast, in Jehoshaphat, uh, we see a woman who is humble. Uh, we see someone who fears God. Uh, we see someone who possesses a living and an active faith. In one sense, these verses seem to suggest that all is over, that the covenant that God made with David is, is finished, it's done for. But on the other hand, we can look at it in another way, and we can see that there is light shining through this dear woman. She shines as a, a bright light in the darkness. It's the dawn that has just broken over the eastern sky. Sometimes we refer to John Wycliffe as the morning star of the Reformation, all seen such, in such darkness, in such a, a perilous state in terms of Christendom in the different the, the Western world. And yet there is God who raises up this man, John Wycliffe, and his light shines. And there begins this this understanding of Scripture, which is going eventually to transform the nations and the continents of the world. And here is Jehoshaphat. She is in an age of, of darkness. The, these verses and these chapters are, are dark, aren't they? And, and yet here is this one that God has in place. And yet many commentators seem to pass her by in, in their haste to reach the coronation of this young king, Joash. I want to pause then just for a moment this morning and to consider who this woman was. Who was she? Well, she's the daughter of the king, King Ahaziah, <clears throat> she is the, the brother of, um, sorry, she's the brother of Ahaziah, she's the, the daughter of the king Jehoram, who was the, the, the husband of, of Athaliah. A parallel passage in 2 Chronicles 22 and in verse 11 tells us that she is also the, the wife of the high priest. So we know that she is the daughter of a king. Uh, she's probably not the same. She's not the daughter of Athaliah. It appears that she has not um, come from that relationship, but another of the, the king's wives. She's the wife of the high priest, Jehoiada. And we know her name, Jehoshaphat. Many of those in this these chapters are, are nameless, but, but she has a name. And Jehoshaphat means Jehovah has sworn. A name that surely is significant, as we shall see. In 2 Chronicles 22 and verse 11, she has a slightly different meaning or rendering to this name, Jehoshabeath, uh, which... It means that Jehovah is an oath. He himself is an oath. She is a woman who is little known. We, apart from this incident, we wouldn't have known anything about her. We wouldn't have known her name. We wouldn't have known who Jehoiada's wife was. We probably wouldn't even have known necessarily who Jehoiada was. But she is in the place that God has put her in. And what we see in this chapter is that a reminder that God works through people. You read through this whole chapter, there are references to the Lord, but they're 
incidental. God isn't working here uh, through great demonstrations of his power. We read there uh, of the affliction of the children of Israel in Egypt, and ultimately they were delivered uh, from the hand of Pharaoh. And God demonstrated his sovereign power and authority uh, by the plagues that Moses was brought upon the Egyptians. Or we've thought about Hezekiah and how he was delivered from the great Assyrian army. God worked in mighty power. He sent his angel and just one angel destroyed the whole of the Assyrian army. But God here in this chapter is only, if you like, mentioned incidentally in the names of his people, Jehoshaphat. Jehovah has swore. Or in the names of his house, the temple of the Lord, the house of God. He's clearly there and behind everything that is happening, but, but he's not before us um, doing great and, and mighty miracles uh, to bring about his work and his purpose. And that is how God works so often down through the ages. He doesn't intervene with tremendous miracles. He has done and he can do. But he takes men and women. He takes those who are perhaps little known. He takes those that have no name whatsoever. And you go back to the lovely portion in 2 Kings 5 and the little maid in the household of Naaman. She's not known, but God used her. God blessed her witness of testimony uh, to the God of Israel. And that is how God works. So often uh, throughout history, he has those whom he will use in his place, in his time, and in his day. Jehoshaphat didn't choose when she was born. She didn't choose to whom uh, she was born. God chose her. God chose her for this day and for this generation. God chose her in order that this act might be recorded here in these verses. And that's so, isn't it, with you and I? We may not be the movers and shakers of this world. When we are laid in the grave and present with our Lord, may soon be forgotten, unknown to men. We had no choice in our parents. We had no choice in the particular day in which we lived. We had no choice as to our nationality. But the day of our birth, the parents that we had, and all that surrounds our lives are not random. God chose our birth. God chose our life's work even before the world began. That is the sovereignty of God. That is the wisdom of God. That is the perfection of God's knowledge. The circumstances that we face in our lives we face them because God has chosen uh, that we should face them in that way. He sees that they are needful uh, for us. They are profitable for his kingdom. And so we were thinking last Lord's Day of those words in John 13 and verse 7 where Jesus calls upon us to be servants and to do uh, those things that God requires of us. He may not know what he is doing now, but we bless God for that hereafter when we shall see that he has worked all things together for his glory and for our greater good. So here is this woman, Jehoshaphat. 
we might see that she is a very humble woman. The first thing that we might see here is humility. Again, that's a tremendous contrast, isn't it, between Athaliah and Jehoshaphat. Athaliah was a very proud, conceited woman who was grasping for the reins of power. You might say that Jehoshaphat had no less of a claim to the throne. She was the daughter of the king, and all the king's sons had been slain. She was sister to Ahaziah. She also might have been agitating for a place on the throne. She also might have been working in the background, raising an army to create a, a civil war and to topple Athaliah from the throne, but she does no such thing. She chooses to serve God and to wait his time. And there is humility uh, to be seen here in the character of this woman. But then chiefly we might see that there is faith in evidence in what we see of Jehoshaphat. We might explore the, the meaning of these names in this second verse. And as we said, they're full of references to, to God. Jehoram, uh, or Joram, the king, means God, Jehovah, is exalted. Ahaziah, a little yar at the end of his name, gives us the clue. Means possessed of the Lord, in the hand of the Lord. Joash, the little lad, was given a name which included uh, the name of Jehovah. He was given by the Lord. The high priest, Jehoiada, his name means Jehovah knows. Again and again, as we look at these names, uh, they speak to us of God and his work, a God who is to be exalted, a God who holds his people in his hand, a God who knows all that is taking place, a God who has sworn and none can change his words. For all these names, it seems as though only the high priest and his wife had uh, a realization of what theirs meant and were able to at least live a part, in part in the message that it brought to them. Jehoshaphat seems to indicate to us here, through her faith and what she did, that she understood something of what her name meant. If God has sworn, when God speaks, it is as though he has given his oath, his word, because his word cannot be broken. Jesus himself said that in John 10, verse 35, if, God, if he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, quoting from the Old Testament, he goes on to say, Scripture cannot be broken. If God has spoken, his word cannot be altered. His word cannot be broken. And it seems that this belief, this faith, drives the action of this woman. As she takes this young prince, she sees what is happening. She, I don't know, maybe the, the rumors started going around through the palace uh, that this was what Athaliah had commanded to, to, to be done. And for one moment, suppose that Athaliah herself actually committed this dastardly deed. She would have been like Herod of old, had his army go and, and kill all those uh, of two years' age and under. Or like Pharaoh, who entrusted his uh, command to those midwives uh, of the Israelites. 
We can imagine Athaliah gives the command to her, to her guard uh, that they are to go and uh, they are to kill all these sons of the king. And Jehoshaphat hears of what's going on. It's, it soon spreads faster than those men can travel throughout uh, the palace. And she, in a moment, snatches up this young prince, this little baby of one years old, and she takes him uh, to the bedchamber there in verse 2. It's literally the, not a place where they slept, but it's the place where they stored their, their bedding, their mattresses, uh, and so on. Nobody would normally go into this storeroom. And she snatches him away, and you can see her going down the corridor and just sneaking into this storeroom and hiding this baby until the coast is clear. And she then takes him and she puts him and keeps him in the temple in a secure place. And it's her faith that God has spoken, that God has made his covenant, whether she uh, understood exactly what she was doing in terms of the, the covenant of David, whether it was she was driven by pity and, and compassion, probably uh, something of both. But over the, all uh, this incident and at the back of her faith, supporting her faith, the ground of her faith, is the sense that when God speaks, then that is final. Hebrews 6 and verse 18 speaks of two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie in order that we might have a strong consolation. God gives the immutable promise. His promise cannot be changed. And then we're told he confirmed it with an oath for our strong consolation. Goes on to say, you know, those who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Jehoshaphat had taken hold of this hope that was set before her. That God had spoken. That the promised seed would be born to the line of David. She had grasped this truth that God had spoken to Adam in the Garden of Eden. That the seed would crush the serpent's head. <clears throat> she grasped the truth of the covenant that was given uh, to Abraham. That it would be his seed through whom the world would be saved. Those who, by faith, would be more than the sand upon the seashore or the stars in the heavens. She's moved by faith. She's a woman who's filled with boldness and courage. Faith fills with boldness and it fills with courage. In the face of armed guards that were working their way systematically through uh, the palace precincts and palace rooms. She has the courage and the boldness to take this little child and to hide him. And we have God's hiding places before us in this bedchamber. It reminds us of those uh, places that God has appointed as refuges uh, for those that are tried, for those that are struggling. If Satan has his herods uh, by whom he will slay the infants, then God has prepared a hiding place in Egypt for his son. If Satan has his pharaohs who would kill all the male children. Then God has his midwives that fear God. As we read there in Exodus chapter 1. God has his hiding places. His refuges. 
to keep even the vulnerable, helpless babes safe. We need to understand that God is not, as we sometimes refer to it, firefighting. He's not just reacting to the circumstances as they unfold. Now, what shall I do now? As so often, we perhaps respond. We hadn't seen something coming, maybe we should have done. Or maybe it's a consequence of what we've done, uh, that we're in a mess and in a problem. And what will we do now? God isn't like that. All this is planned. His oath, his covenant stands. Indeed, Satan does the will of God. When Satan has done all that he can, he is only doing ultimately the will of God so that the Lord Jesus Christ is driven down into Egypt in order that the word of God might be fulfilled. Out of Egypt, said the prophet, have I called my son. God has his hiding places. God has his people. God has those in whom faith dwells. Those who have listened to the word of the Lord. So you work your way through those in that catalogue in Hebrews 11. And you find that it is those who have faith, who have listened to God's word. There was Noah by faith in verse 7 of Hebrews 11. By faith Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet. Moved with fear, prepared an ark. But the catalyst of it is the word of God, the warning of God, the speech of God. Those parents of Moses in Hebrews eleven twenty three, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. They, like Moses, after them, chose to serve the Lord. Uh, they chose to listen to God rather than to men. They feared not the commandment of a mighty king in Pharaoh because they saw that God was greater, that it's God's word that will stand and not that of Pharaoh. And Jehoshaphat belongs in those last verses uh, that we read together in Hebrews 11. You may not be able to identify exactly uh, where she would fit in, but surely she belongs uh, to those in uh, those of faith there at the end of that chapter. In all sorts of different situations, in all sorts of different circumstances, they hold on to the promise of God in all the darkness that they face, in all the difficult circumstances that are before them, their faith is in the living God, that he has spoken, that his oath and his covenant will stand. You might think of Jehoshaphat and you think, well, maybe it's, it's tempting for her to, to side with the stronger party. We've seen that in only... So just the previous chapter, when Jehu is on his rampage in the northern kingdom, and those that were sheltering and the guardians of uh, the, the king's sons and the king's descendants decided that actually Jehu was the one that they would follow and that they would serve. And Jehoshaphat might well have felt, well, it's obvious that the star of Athaliah, as it were, is in the ascendancy, and I will, I will follow her, I will obey her, I will side with her. By faith, she sees one who is stronger than Athaliah. She sees her God, and she is prepared to trust him and his covenant, even though uh, to all uh, normal appearances it is finished and it is done. But her faith is strong. Her faith is active. Her faith makes her bold and courageous.
in that we have a person, a woman here of faith in Jehoshaphat, then we can perhaps apply that to ourselves. But maybe it's even more direct when we just consider that she is the wife of the high priest. We look at Jehoiada maybe on another occasion. But just see for a moment that this woman is the wife of the high priest. And as soon as we mention the high priest, then surely our minds go to our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. As we belong to him, as we trusted him, and we are his bride. Our Lord Jesus Christ has a bride. He is the bridegroom. His wife is his church, his people. And so in Jehoshaphat, we have an illustration of what the church should be like, what you and I should be like in our lives, in these circumstances that God has placed us in. As Jehoshaphat exercised faith and humility, even though she was in the midst of a godless and a persecuting world, so we, by the grace of God, are to exercise that same faith and humility in this world in which we live. Or maybe we see in Jehoshaphat uh, someone who is uh, holding up the truth. She is prepared to nail her colors to the mast. And so Paul writes to uh, Timothy and he, he speaks of those things that Timothy should do and should be. In 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15, if I tarry long, if I, Paul, can't come to you, I want to come, but if I can't, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. You are to be the pillar that holds up the truth. And that's how that chapter ends in that familiar verse, 1 Timothy 3, verse 16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into the glory, into glory. We are to be the pillars and the ground of those truths, that truth, holding it up for this world to see, hiding it, cherishing it in our heart until better days come. We're to be like uh, Jehoshaphat, uh, there in the darkness, shining as lights in the dark place. Philippians 2, once again, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Lights in a dark place, snatching one here and another there as brands from uh, the fire as we spread the gospel, as we preach and teach of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we send forth his word to bring men and women into this one and only refuge for sinners in the Lord Jesus Christ. To be the salt of the, and the light of the earth, to preserve uh, godliness in the sphere in which we move. Jehoshaphat, her light shone and the covenant of God was upheld and maintained in the day in which she lived. And so you come to the time when six years later the king is brought out and publicly proclaimed and Athaliah is 
removed from office. Well, may God give us his grace. May God grant us his blessing. And God help us to live by faith in the darkness of this world, that our light might shine. Amen. Amen.